or the echoing bit. It takes a village, people. It takes a village. Echo to infinity. Hey, we're not purple. 1.5 shakes. That's right. All right. Now, welcome back to, <laughs> to week three. Hopefully, everything's good now, and the sound is quality, and we're able to uh, uh, continue on because of the new YouTubeness. We can actually clip out that first part whenever this gets published. So let's get right into it. We have finally sort of got some ideas down for a basic outline that we are going to try to follow every week, and that is going to be starting with a beer style of the week, which will kind of all segue into a hop variety of the week, and then also a grain or malt of the week that we're going to be kind of focusing on all involved with that beer style. Um, and then we're going to transition into shop updates, just things that are going around uh, here, new toys like I have next to me. And uh, and then that is going to go into uh, anything like no, also new beers that we have on tap. And then our focus topics, which this week happen to be kettle, kettle sours. sours and also why small batches suck. <laughs> AKA just why they're not a good idea to try to learn about beer. With. Th that'll be a fun one to go into. Uh, and then all, as always, we will finish with a Q and a, um, but uh, hopefully we're going to be getting a little bit more structured here with the live streams. That way it's a more predictable format for you guys. And you guys can kind of skip through and find the pieces that you want. And then also know what to expect and what you're going to get out of each, uh, each week from us. All right. Well, let's get right into our updates or no beer style, beer style, right? We're doing that first. Yeah, style, style of the week. We should come up with a jingle for that. It's the style, style of, of the, the week. week. Nailed it. Okay. That's our jingle. Anyway, we're going to uh, give, you, give you a style of a wit beer because we randomly decided to choose that for this week. Wit yeah. beer seems like a good, you know, February kind of style. I don't know. I haven't had a good wit beer in a while, honestly. Yeah. The last one that I think I had was one that we made. Uh, no, there was a, I think I went to one of the breweries around here and found a pretty good one, but... It's uh, they are hard to find. Wit beers are not as uh, big of a style as they used to be. Pretty much, yes. Speaking of which, a wit beer is a traditional Belgian style beer. It is a very light colored wheat base to mm -hmm. it, and uh, what really, really separates out a wit beer, at least what I'd like to tell customers when they're asking about, you know, how it compares to say like an American wheat beer, something like your Woodmer Hefeweizen, um, or sort of your Weinstefen wheat, your Pauliner. Um, I don't know. Is the, they have is just Paul Lehner or is it? Oh, they're, they're probably every German brewing company yeah. in the world has some sort of a some kind of a thing. A um, beer. And really, what separates it out is the yeast that we're using. In fact, there's probably one like right behind my head. Probably. And uh, wit beers are really known for having a really really intense clovey type character to the yeast. Um, a lot of phenols that are thrown out for it, um, which give it that intensity. But also, there's like a few other things that kind of go on the back end, Peter, that also separate it out, right? Yeah, so whip beers are in general going to be drier and they have that kind of spicy component. And part of that does come from the yeast, just throwing some clove and spice. And part of that comes from using things like uh, orange peel and coriander, which are the classic spices thrown in. Mm -hmm. uh, coriander is obviously just a really good spice to throw into a lot of beers. You would surprise yourself if you threw that into something like a, even an amber. They create It creates pre pretty awesome flavors. Or a cook. Cook. As someone said, they just make, <laughs> make that's word. Have one gallon of Scoob, Scoby soured yep. blueberry quike. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Yep. So as for the grain bill, usually you're going to be looking at um, more or less uh, Pilsner malt as a base, but then probably somewhere in the range of 40 to 60 percent of a uh, of some kind of wheat, wheat and other flaked adjuncts. Which brings us to our malt of the week. No, Bam. Don't have a jingle for that one yet no. either. <laughs> Um, and we're going to be talking about flaked oats that you might actually see used in a wit beer. And flaked oats are an unmalted adjunct grain that we'll also be doing a video about to hopefully finish up our malt series. All adjuncts in general. Um, all adjuncts in general. Uh, but uh, flaked oats are unmalted and they are gelatinized through the flaking process. And what that does is it gives you a whole bunch of chewy proteins and beta glucans and things that'll really thicken up a beer because uh, wit beer will otherwise dry itself pretty pretty down to a bone. Yeah, oats are a very versatile grain that I've seen used in a lot of things. Traditionally, like, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I pretty much only saw oats and things like an oatmeal stout. And, you know, people were like, oh, I'm so cool. I'm kicking up my stout by giving it some puffiness with oats. 
I love throwing it in whip beers. That extra slickness you get from it, um, there's a little bit of oil content in oats that kind of plays a role as well, uh, but that extra slickness from the oats really balances out the bright spiciness of the, um, of the whip beer with the coriander and the orange. Uh, but I've seen it thrown in, I mean, a lot of people are throwing it in pails these days, and then of course with uh, sours becoming a big thing, oats be, you know, play a big role there. Pretty much. So let's talk about uh, the last bit of our sort of uh, beer style of the week, which is going to be the hops. And uh, traditionally, wit beers really aren't about hops. Your, your hop schedules on, on these are typically going to be a very, very small bittering edition. Sometimes that might actually be it. Otherwise, you might have maybe a five or ten minute edition towards the end. That's, that's a small amount of traditionally a noble hop. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about the hop variety of Pearl. Yeah, Pearl's a really fun one. Uh, it's very, very versatile. You see Pearl in two major kind of categories. One is the old world grown in Germany, German mm-hmm. style Pearl, and the other is going to be the American Pearl. Uh, but Pearl actually originated when uh, the Huhl Institute, I believe it was, was trying to find Jesus. a substitute for Hallertau Mittelfru, which is a very popular uh, hop back in the day. Um, so it ended up becoming uh, bred off of that, and it is uh, uh, the its mother is actually Northern Brewer, which is a fun fun fact, and then its father is some uh, unknown bastardized remnant of Hallertau Mittelfru. <laughs> which actually makes sense, too, because uh, one of the things I like personally about Pearl is that that variety typically has a little bit higher alpha acids to it, so for bittering any kind of traditional German beer, um, it means you can use less of that hop. And uh, that's something I like. You know, typically I see, I think right now it's running low, which is like six-ish percent alphas, but yeah, I've seen it think, up pushing 10 per- percent before. Yeah, and there's um, some American varietals that can go even higher than that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, for flavor profile, um, the most consistent flavor I get from year to year in Pearl um, is a really, really nice, delicate black pepper character. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially in a wit beer where you're all already getting some kind of white pepper characteristic from the yeast itself. And the coriander. Uh, then that black pepper can blend really nicely into the beer. Yeah, uh, you also get subtle notes of like kind of lemon and grass, uh, like that nice kind of floral quality that would come from a traditional Hallertown middle fruit. Uh, but then if you use German-style pearl, which is a little bit on the lower end of the alpha at- acid spectrum from pearl, you can get subtle hints of things like mint and wood, uh, indicative of its northern brewer mother. Yep. Otherwise, pretty pretty clean, clean bittering hop is the other thing. So clean bittering hop, clean hop all around. Use it maybe in a five-gallon batch. Use, use uh, probably no more than an ounce in total in a wit beer. Um, probably something like a quarter ounce for your bittering addition, if that, and then maybe just a half ounce at the end. Because why not? Moving on. Mm. Updates. Yeah, new beers. Shop we, updates. We got uh, new beers on tap. We, we have, have new beers uh, on tap. Last week we tapped the peach chew, which was a peach sour. has been going over quite well. We had a little bit of a teaser on that with our Instagram. If you follow us on Instagram, you would have seen that. Um, and then as of yesterday that we have not even posted until, well, now I guess, um, is we have our fourth iteration of the Count Chocula Breakfast one, Stout. Two. And this one is thick. It's chewy. It's good. It's vanilla-y. Yeah, we added a lot of things to kind of boost that chocolate flavor that we got off of the Count Chocula cereal. Um, there's a Yeah, there's a lot that went into it, but it, I think it's the roundest and probably most approachable of the Count Choculas it's that we've done so far. A true dessert beer. That's right. That's what we're going for. Because when you see, hear Count Chocula, you think dessert for breakfast. And when you hear Count Chocula beer, hopefully you think beer for breakfast. So weird. Anyway, what are some uh, new videos that we got out this week for all those that have not been updated? So we posted the uh, brown side-by-side-by-side where we took three different, res- or three different beers made with the exact same recipe uh, on paper. And then uh, we used three different br- brands of brown malt to make it, and then we tasted that and let you know that our favorite brown malt is still Hugh Baird's. What else? Is that the only one we got up? Uh, we also posted our glasses video. I don't know if you guys watched the glasses video that oh, we yeah. posted yesterday, two days ago, something like that. Yep, we did that. That, that was a thing. Super fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, turns out tortillas actually work reasonably well for holding a pint of beer. Tortillas can hold a pint of beer, and we proved it because um. that's the kind of folk we are. <laughs> As for videos in the works, uh, we have, what do we got upcoming? Uh, oh, yeah, we got to finish our um, adjunct malt video. Um, and then hopefully later today, we will actually be trying to shoot 
um, a sort of maybe a series, but at least a video that has the premise of will it mash um, in a sense that either I, one of us will go to the store, find something random, and the other one will have to make a beer with it. So, so we're, we're trying to get back into videos that are fun for us. Uh, it's nice doing all these, you know, really information load heavy kind of videos that we've been putting out. But at the same time, we also want to bring some fun aspects back into the channel and, you know, do things that we enjoy doing and that hopefully can give you entertainment on top of education. So that's kind of a fun, uh, I want to call it maybe like chopped kitchen style brewing. Something, something like that. Something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, that'll be really fun. Uh, we also got a new piece of equipment in, which we're really excited about. <gasps> It's right here. It's right. Can you see it? <laughs> this is a hot back that can hold up to 15 pounds of pressure. We got this from Stout Tanks. Um, and we're super excited because being a small scale brewery, there's a lot of things that we're not physically capable of doing that larger breweries have an advantage uh, over us on. Uh, and this will hopefully kind of bridge that gap a little bit. You want to tell them why? Uh, because pulley hops are cheap. Pulley hops are cheap. <laughs> Uh, that's really why, honestly. Uh, yeah, we can uh, find some crazy deals on Holy Pops, but usually they are not necessarily the best just to kind of throw in a kettle with everything else. However, with that guy, we can uh, load it up with them, and we can do a pressure transfer, run it through our uh, wort chiller, our, our kind of counterflow chiller, uh, and hopefully keep all of those aromatics and oils in there going straight into the fermenter so that they don't volatize off. Uh, being able to pressure transfer is a really great way of getting really clean and big hop flavor into your, uh, into your fermenter, basically, which you don't necessarily have that advantage when you have to throw pellet hops into an open kettle because as it's an open kettle, it's able to volatilize off a little bit easier. Uh, and again, there's not as good of a way to uh, kind of filter all that gunk out, which means you're going to end up with some plant material in your kettle also. Yeah. Um, the other fun thing that I'm excited to do with this is if we're on a seven barrel or five barrel scale, we can do flavor infusions with the hop back while keeping everything closed and never having to open up the fermenter. Which is also good because, you know, oxygen is bad. Oxygen is bad. And then also having to clean a bunch of lemons out of a seven barrel fermenter is... I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> So that's why we're excited about our hot back. One more step towards being able to do what the big boys do. Yay, stuff and stuff. All right, well, let's get into our focus topics. Let's start with why small batches suck. This actually was sort of inspired by uh, one of our YouTube view viewers asking us a question. Um, he kind of wanted to experiment with all these new ingredients that we always talk about on the channel. And he wanted to do that in, I think, one liter batches. And was kind of asking us, like, hey, like, what's the best way to do this? Like, is without having a mess and just things being a giant pain in the butt. And before we get too far, we're not saying don't do small batches. We're not, you know, saying you guys are stupid for yeah. doing small batches. What we're saying is if you're trying to get that consistency and trying to gain uh, information specific to nuanced ingredients like yeast or like uh, certain malts, that small batches really aren't a very reliable way to do that. Plus, if you make something super tasty, why do you want to only have, you know, a small amount of it? Yep. Maybe we drink too much. I don't know. Bam. So uh, the biggest issue that you run into with um, small batch beers is control and consistency. And those are just kind of like the two points that I just like to hammer home over and over and over again. Um, because the reality is, is even on a one barrel scale, um, we acknowledge here that we don't have nearly as much control and consistency as something at, that a five barrel scale has, um, which still doesn't have as much control and consistency as even a 20 or 30 barrel system. And that just has to do with as you scale up, um, things become, I guess, more or less automated. And that's part uh, of it. Yeah. yeah, more or less automated. And you end up using the exact same methods, the exact same process every single time. Um, and that's going to give you a better idea when you change anything in that beer of what, how it's going to affect the flavor. And part of this does have to do with thermal mass. Uh, so thermal mass by itself uh, makes it a little bit more consistent and controllable, for example, when you're doing something like mashing in or with a step mash. If you are step mashing on a one gallon scale, just for example, while you're bringing water off of your mash to heat up for another step, or if you're doing a decoction or something like that, the remainder of your mash can cool down so it's rapidly. It's actually cooling off on you, yeah. Yeah, so the, you have no way to accurately calculate something like a step mash. Um, the same thing kind of goes when, uh, when you're playing with your yeast, for example. 
uh, small changes in your room temperature on the one be one gallon scale or one liter scale especially uh, can really affect how your yeast are going to perform and so the bigger you get at least the more consistent you can get and hopefully if you're on the size somewhere like one barrel or above you have some sort of a glycol system to accurately tame those beast modes yep and get the same temperatures of fermentation every single time um, on the note of yeast too um, a big kind of part of flavor profiles of beer is actually your pitch rates mm -hmm. um, and we're you know obviously we kind of preach to the choir about like more more is better however when you're doing that on really small scales it's it becomes a lot more difficult to actually measure the yeast and try to get that like same ratio of, of what is it I got written down so it's like so and the big guys they actually measure out their yeast and they will purposely put um, a certain amount of yeast cells per milliliter multiplied by the original gravity of the beer that they're brewing. So it's, it's not just, you know, per volume, it's actually a ratio also of the actual amount of sugar those yeast are going to chew through. Yep. So that becomes very, very difficult to, to regulate on a, on a small scale that's, you know, yeah, on like a half gallon or something like that. Yep, your pitch rate's going to be a little bit uh, weird, which means sometimes your yeast will take off and make a lot of fusely alcohols. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll follow a normal fermentation curve and create a nice clean beer. Uh, and then sometimes you'll just get some explosion that you don't even understand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, also, consistency <clears throat> in your boiling and cooling process. Um, obviously, the, the environment around you has some impact on it, um, but also the, whatever vessel that you're trying to boil in, um, whether your water was a little bit warm or a little bit cold on your stovetop, usually you're going to be doing those small batches. Um, yeah, just consistency through that. Um, your times are probably going to vary quite a bit from batch to batch, which is also going to affect the flavor of the beer. That's right. Um, yeah, things like evaporation rate in the boil kettle, just yeah. as an example. Hop utilization as hop well. Utilization that's really that's kind of actually a, a really big one is uh, the hop utilization and, and uh, yeah, whether that boil – you know, how vigorous that boil is, right, on your stovetop. Fun fact with hop utilization is that the things actually change dramatically when you go uh, increase your volume size for the reason that they basically the partial pressure, the pressure on your liquid uh, increases with your increased volume. Uh, basically what that means is there's hardly any pressure if you're boiling a gallon and a half of liquid uh, on, you know, anywhere in the chunk of liquid and so your hops aren't susceptible to the same amount of pressure but if you're on a seven barrel scale for example you're boiling 240 gallons uh, 230 gallons down to that 220 to 210 then the temperature on the bottom of that boil can theoretically be hotter than boiling because there's a lot of pressure on it uh, which means you're going to get a different utilization from your hops fun facts all right and then um oh control over oxidization i think is, a lot, is one of the last things to hit um, yeah, that's the other thing is there's just not very easy ways to transfer to try to keep things as closed up as possible, especially for those hop forward beers that people love to drink nowadays um, on a small scale. And yeah, you're just going to end up oxidizing them if you don't have a good method to get it from, you know, one fermenter to into, I guess, another bottle <laughs> um, in a very, very closed sanitary way, um, which is just going to end up with off flavors in the beer. And that's pretty much it on why small batches might not be the best thing yep. for quality control slash consistency. Um, if you're just looking to experiment and you want to take off a beer that you already have and infuse it with something, you know, just to try, you know, I don't know, a fruit infusion or something like that, go for it. But if you're doing it for scientific purposes, it's probably not the most reliable mechanism. Yep. I would stick to your five-gallon batches. Um, generally, I don't recommend anything less than about three, in my opinion. I feel like yeah. some systems... Um, you can be pretty consistent with, with three-ish gallon batches, but yeah, you start getting down to the one gallon batches. I've tried a few of them personally, and um, honestly, they're just not worth the time. Yeah, and let's be honest, the average home brewer probably drinks between five and 10 gallons of beer per week. So, you know, you can There's brew a batch, yeah, a batch yeah. of beer a week and you'll be fine. All right, let's go on to the next topic, which is kettle sours. Our favorite style to yeah. brew. We did some videos, uh, golly, a year or so ago now on them, but uh, I think we can do a better job um, talking about them today because really they've the, the methods and the processes to, to get from point A to point B have, have evolved quite a bit. That's right. 
Um, so speaking of processes, there are three main ways to do a kettle sour. Uh, the first and simplest way is actually just to add lactic acid. You make a beer that would normally taste like a not sour, and then you add enough lactic acid to make it taste sour. Yep. Uh, lactic acid is actually a great way to do this because it's a, it's a very mild acid. It actually comes across as almost um, sweet and, and, like, I don't want to say buttery, but smooth. Yeah, very sweet. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's a fruity? very... Yeah, it fruity. accentuates fruits, I think. Yeah, it definitely well. accentuates fruitiness. Um, with that said, um, one of our customers brought up acid blend. To me, I think just yesterday. Acid blend? Yeah. So we have acid blend, which is oh, yeah. lactic, I believe, malic, and what's the other one? Uh, tartaric. Tartaric, yeah. Tartaric's an okay acid because it also isn't uh, entirely aggressive. Malic acid I would personally stay away from just because malic acid can get aggressive pretty fast, Yeah. especially on the small scale. Um, yeah, but I, know, I do know people use acid blend, I would say. Yeah. From my experience, I would just steer clear of that because lactic acid is the best acid yeah. in the world. But it might add a little complexity, so you never know. If you I, want, I'd yeah, experiment with it. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> that's the easiest way to do it. Anything that you got that's light and hoppy, you know, go for it if you want to make, right. a, make a quick and easy sour. The problem with that, though, is it creates a one-dimensional acid note, uh, and you, you miss some nuanced esters that you actually get off of a proper acid fermentation. So let's go on to the next thing that you can do. Bam, and that is going to be pitching um, a pure pitch of, of yeast, which is usually we carry the Y yeast lactobacillus, um, but also this is what you hear with everyone getting the Good Belly yogurt and uh, throwing that in there because that also has, um, I think, a couple different strains of lactobacillus in it. Good Belly, I think, is only plantarum. Is it just plantarum? Yeah. But there are ways to go about with things like yogurt or things like uh, um, certain digestive probiotics and stuff like that that'll have a lot. Uh, what I would recommend if you ever are curious whether or not a yogurt or a probiotic will work as a lactobacillus pitch is check Milk the Funk. Uh, they, they have a wiki listing out all the different styles of lactobacillus and if they will make a good beer or if they make something that you don't want. Perfect. Yep, so you're going to pitch that into your wort after you chill it down to about 120 degrees and let that go to town for a day or two or three, depending on how crazy you want to get with it. Yeah. Um, and then the final method that we actually like to use here is inoculating your wort with acidulated malt. We use Best Malls um, acid malt, and that is naturally a carrier of lactobacillus, amongst other things. And uh, we do sort of the same process. Generally, we'll chill our wort down to about 120 to 125 degrees, actually. We really like to keep it on that high end. Um, and then we'll uh, steep some of that acid malt in there to inoculate it and get it, get it going. Another thing we could theoretically do with a hop back and not have to put the acid malt in our fermenter directly. There we go. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the process that we go when we do any sort of fermented uh, acidification of a sour. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do if we know for a fact that we're doing a kettle sour is we're going to actually pre-acidulate our mash. So typically you might see in a light beer um, some acid malt in there to begin with just for a little bit of mash pH adjustment um, in the range of maybe four to six ounces. Uh, but we're going to, or for a five gallon batch too, let me make this clear. Uh, but but we're going to up that quite a bit. We're actually going to throw in, um, I usually recommend at least a pound. I know Peter's done, you've done more, haven't you? Two and a half pounds uh, for five gallons. I was going to say, yeah, you've that done. Inoculation, yeah, I was good. yeah, but in the mash itself, you've done, you've, pound. you've done, yeah. See, I, I've, I'll even throw a pound in there. He, he usually does a half a pound. But then I, I pitch two pounds, which is also acidifies. Yeah, exactly. Either way, you're looking at uh, somewhere between two and three pounds total of acid malt going into the actual beer, and uh, you're going to start by pre-acidulating the mash. And what that's going to do is it's going to keep uh, keep your brett, keep some of those other nasty bugs at bay uh, when you actually add it to to either your kettle once you get it down to temp, or we actually put it in our fermenters uh, just so we can kind of keep things somewhat closed up as well. My wife sees me getting beer. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's the first step is pre-acidulation. And then the second step is going to be your inoculation, which is where you're going to add another pound to two pounds per five-gallon batch. Just depends, again, on how crazy you want to get, how fast also um, in the inoculation step. Yes, you could add a half pound, um, and it might take you three days to get where you want to be pH-wise. Um, if you add two pounds, it might only be overnight. Um, so that's just kind of depends on how fast you want to get there. 
Um, but then the biggest part I would say at this point is, is holding that temperature hot, which is probably the most difficult thing for home brewers to do. Uh, what I honestly recommend is probably putting it, um, putting it either in your kettle or in a fermenter that you can wrap up with a blanket, put a, put one of the heat wraps around it, do something to maintain it as warm as possible. Cause if you do happen to drop down to say a hundred degrees or so, um, you're definitely risking um, other yeast cells, other other things getting in there and actually starting up a fermentation, which has never happened here, right? Nope. Well, you know, if you accidentally make a raw ale, <laughs> so be it. Some people will do that instead. They'll do a raw ale for their kettle sours, and then they'll they'll basically throw their wort into the fermenter, and a day later they'll co-pitch a yeast and then just let it ride. And that, that can make some fantastic sours. Yes, I have a breakfast beer. Is this a um, blend? Someone said, no, it's just a peach chew. Huh. Um, someone says, greetings from Russia, and it is probably 5 o'clock there. Um, but one thing that is really fun to do going back to kettle sours and maintaining that hot fermentation temperature is we have the SS Brewtech uh, fermenters that have the heating and chilling, well, they have the chilling coil inside it. What we'll do is we'll take something like our mash and boil or our anvil foundry, and uh, we'll actually set that to about 120 degrees, and we'll just constantly pump that through the heating coil on the inside. And so what that'll do is it'll equalize the beer right around 109 uh, somewhere in that range, degrees Fahrenheit. No idea what that is in Celsius. Sorry. Yeah, I don't want to do the math right now. Um, anyway, and then next step is once you get down to the pH, uh, generally we just use pH strips and just guesstimate and then also use our actually our, our tongues. Those are probably the best thing. Taste buds are for the, are the winners. Yep, taste buds. Once you get it to a point where you're happy with it, you're going to put it back in your kettle. You're going to reboil it and then uh, chill it back down and pitch uh, we like to use specifically a German ale yeast. Um, doesn't really matter where you're getting it from, but a German ale strain, and that is because uh, those strains are the most tolerant to acidic environments. Uh, we actually did this beer with O4. S04, yeah. And uh, I actually noticed it did stall out towards the end of fermentation. and Which is fine for a sw slightly sweeter beer. Yeah, exactly. We were going for that. We actually did it on purpose, but uh, – and that – is all contributed to the fact that the pH just got too low and that yeast kicked the bucket. So if you want to make sure that you get full attenuation, stick with a German ale strain. It's just the way to go. Um, those guys will ferment down to like 3-2 or something crazy like that without yeah. without breaking a sweat. If so. you get them a good enough running start, they'll go even lower. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, and then after that, enjoy it or dry hop it. I know we've made some fantastic dry hopped kettle sours as well. Um, interesting effect that happens when you get down into that sort of mid three range of ph is that it'll take any kind of a fruity hop and really accentuate any citrus note or any kind of um, turns it into like a pineapple -y thing any any kind of fruit that you can think of that's naturally acidic it'll actually push that quality through the hop in the hop which is a uh, kind of an interesting effect uh cheers frazzled penguin and good luck on your brew day. Um, all right. 2.8 to 3. Damn, somebody's really like, that's like Berliner Weiss range right there. That's getting pretty sour. Yeah. Um. And, uh, yeah, and then also um, let's just kind of round this guy out with a few myths about kettle sours. Um, and the first one is that uh, they're going to sour all your equipment. And on a, on a kind of a, a small homebrew scale, that's, that's really not going to happen, especially with lactobacillus. Uh, I I like to refer to lactobacillus as like the the wuss of the sort of souring world. Um, it most strains can't withstand more than like 10 IBUs or something anyway. And uh, yeah, as long as you got good cleaning and sanitation methods, it's it's nothing to worry about. Yeah. So I, yeah, basically if everything's stainless and you can heat kill, uh, I don't usually worry about lactobacillus when souring. Some people even even Brett honestly, I don't terribly worry about. Yeah, Brett's one a little bit more with plastics, but not still i don't worry about it yeah um and then also that kettle sours taste like yogurt which is actually sort of a myth that i've had in my mind and i think that over the years now that i've tasted quite a few of them uh, some of them definitely do taste like yogurt and i think that all has to do with um the essential pitch rates of of your good belly or whatever you're throwing in i think that if you are adding a proper dose and allowing it to multiply over time you're probably not going to get that flavor but i've had some people come in that say that they're throwing like three or four packs of good belly into their beer 
which at that point, that's a lot of yogurt going into your beer, which is probably why those beers end up tasting like yogurt. Yep, that's basically uh, any, th- any sort of <laughs> inoculant that's yogurt-based. Uh, so. it, can, it can definitely leach some flavors for yeah. sure. Um, and then another kind of misconception about kettle sours or sours in general is that, oh, they're just going to taste awful. They have all these like off flavors to them, this and that and the other thing. And odds are is if they are not tasting clean with you know a nice clean sour characteristic to them, um, that actually has to do with some kind of contamination, some kind of infection uh, that got in there during that souring period. Um, like we mentioned earlier, we try to keep those temps really hot. And if you end up tasting like weird medicinal flavors or um, I'm trying to think of like if you start getting like band-aid type stuff in there, oh. um, then yeah, that's definitely a sign that you got too low on that temperature range during the, the souring period. If you get butyric acid, if it smells like vomit, then uh, yeah. That's a, yeah, if you get butyric acid, that happens with lactic, so a lot of uh, strains of lactobacillus will actually produce butyric acid and you uh, can avoid that somewhat with pre-acidification, but also just with selecting the proper strains of lactobacillus. Plantarum doesn't really throw it. Uh, Bukneri, the one that we've uh, used from Y East, doesn't really do it and has yep. a great flavor. Um, and we have actually, with proper temperature control, never gotten it with just an acid malt pitch. Yep. Um, and then lastly is, uh, what is it? Oh, that you have to have a bunch of high protein content adjunct type grains in your grain bill. Um, and that's sort of a, a holdover from the traditional sour, uh, but uh, really is not necessary. Uh, a lot of people will say that, you know, if you're doing a kettle sour, it's got to be like 50% wheat or something like that. Or they, you know, they're throwing a lot of wheat or oats or flaked barley in there to get that high protein content. Kettle sours can be pretty clean and dry. You can do a 100% two-row base clean kettle sour, especially if you're already planning to back sweeten it with any sort of fruit, to leave some residual sweetness or some extra body in the final beer. Um, and, yeah, so it kind of just depends on what you're going for. If you want that kind of thick, wheaty kind of flavor in your sour, yeah. uh, that's absolutely fine. But there are, really, there are a lot of reasons to do nice, neutral, clean kettle yeah. sours. Unlike a traditional sour that you're going to have a mixed culture that's going, that's sort of chewing away at all those extra proteins that are left over, um, that's not going to happen in a kettle sour. So you, you don't have to have that to get a good flavor from it. Yep. Um, speaking of which, somebody was asking about phosphoric acid. Uh, phosphoric acid is another low flavor threshold acid, which are meaning that you can use a lot of it without really getting that yeah. flavor. Um, you can use it for pre-acidification of your mash, but for getting to the flavor threshold, I wouldn't recommend phosphoric acid. I like to keep it under that uh, flavor threshold yeah. for sure. It's lactic not going to have that sweet approachable flavor that lactic does. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but some people use it just for raw pH, which is fine. Um, I just, yep. yeah, I prefer to use lactic acid or lactic acid based things. Yeah. You could probably use phosphoric, um, kind of post mash, I guess, like as you're, as you're vorlopping off, if you want to just pre-acid, yeah, like, pre-acidification yeah. for the, for the food safeness. Yep. Um, otherwise I think that sums up our kettle sours. So let's, uh, go into our Q and a, I think we're there. All right. Q and a time. Uh, we'll start off at the top cause I saw some early on. Um, somebody said, please sing. Land of the free and home of the brave. That's nope. A, that is not a Q&A. That is a, that is a request. Yeah. Maybe next week. I don't know. I haven't properly warmed up my voice. And you know, you know how it goes with, uh, with not doing your vocal warm-ups. Um, what do you think of a Saison with Pilsner malt, Sabro, hops, and Bella Saison yeast? Uh, I think it sounds good. I think Bella Saison being a slightly funkier, fruitier Saison yeast, those Sabro hops can probably play well. Um, that said, kind of depends on your Pilsner malt, which, you know, yeah. There's a lot of ways to go with it. If you're doing uh, Saison, I think the most important thing isn't necessarily your recipe or ingredients. It's actually the temperature that you ferment at. So with the Bella Saison, I would say make something clean the first time, and then the second time when you have a ton of Bella Saison slurry up in there, throw your next Saison on there and just let it free rise or ramp that thing up to, you know, 85 degrees and really let it cook. Yeah, I don't know how the um, that coconutty character from the Sabro would play with the, with the yeast flavors on that one. That would be... I'd say try it, but, uh, you know, it might be iffy. No. Uh, you can use tropical citrus hops and a uh, wit. Uh, prominent yeast would use tropical and or citrusy hops in a wit. I would do that as a dry hop probably, but not necessarily as a, um, uh, like a bittering hop or a, you know, any yeah. sort of a boil edition hop. Yeah. I'd probably just make a neutral wit with a very clean high alpha hop 
and then use a dry hop to kind of get that same fruity flavor. Fun facts, BJCP actually has a style for that. Really? <laughs> it's called a white IPA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you can totally do that. It's been done before. Uh, if you use just the right hop varieties, uh, it tends to work out very well. Um, yeah, so keep them, keep them light. Keep them, yeah, just like you said, tropical and fruity. Somebody tuned in from Ireland. That's super cool. Um, somebody uses scale to measure things. Hey, guys, watching from Ramrock Five Barrel Brewery in Newfoundland. That's also awesome. Or cereal with a fork. Nice callback to our video from Saturday. It's totally not. Uh, I, I'm very bad about reading. Just added, just the acidulated without using any good build oh yeah so somebody's actually asking about our souring methods and yes we do just pitch the uh um the acid malt as our inoculant you can co-pitch it with a proper strain of lactobacillus uh something like good belly yep. um that said uh the reason that we like using acid malt is it's a much more complex flavor there's actually more than just lactobacillus on there there's a lot of lactic acid yeah. producing bacteria that are natural with the grain and produce some subtle phenolics and uh and esters that add fruitiness and add complexity to the beer you know, the beauty of actually a pure pitch of lacto too is you, which is, I guess is one method I totally spaced on, which is something I've done before and had great results is you don't actually have to do a kettle sour with it. Um, I've, I've brewed a beer before. Uh, I brewed a couple actually. I've done a Berliner Weiss and then I did a Lichtenhainer, um, both of which I pitched lactobacillus into my fermenter, tried to keep it warm ish for a few days and allow that same sort of kettle souring effect to happen, um, but without reboiling it. And I just pitched uh, 1007 on top of that, which is that same German ale strain, and let the beer finish off. And it turned out absolutely fantastic. So if you don't want to kind of go through the whole hassle of uh, the kettle souring process, you can always do that with a pure pitch. It's pretty easy. Uh, sous vide for maintaining temperature on a sour. Uh, yeah, that'll work. That should work. Yeah, it's the low uh, low heat density, right? They should be. Yeah, I guess as long as you're not the like size. burning, yeah, burning your yeasties or anything. It like might that. take multiple sous vides. Someone uses a fish tank heater to keep their temperature when they're uh, when they're souring, which is a good idea. Oh yeah, that'll work. Uh, what yeast would you recommend for a Kentucky Common? Um, I think the last time we've done it, we've done it with a cow lager yeast, the mm. Anchor Steam yeast. Uh, yes, that, that is that is the traditional yeast. Uh, I've also actually used, speaking of German ale, um, I've used a German ale too. Uh, what, what I would recommend for a Kentucky Common is if you're going to use that German ale, actually kind of put it on the extreme end of the, of, uh, cold it's, side. it's, yeah, cold, <clears throat> cold temperature range. I actually prefer to ferment that at about 56 to 60 degrees, um, which seems really cold, but it works out. It just kind of slows it down a little bit and produces a really creamy character from it. Uh, someone says when they kettle sour, the initial souring only drops the OG by three to five points. Um, that also sounds like you have a, a, so certain strains of lactobacillus are what's called heterofermentive. Uh, that means that they can both create alcohol and create lactic acid. Um, so heterofermentive yeasts can actually drop your pH a little bit. Uh, and there are strains that won't drop your, your, uh, your original gravity, I should say. There are strains that won't drop that gr original gravity at all. So yeah. maybe play around with different inoculating techniques, uh, different uh, strains of lactobacillus, and you, know, you might get yeah. zero things dropped. That said, three to five uh, OG points is not – that's not yeah. a ton, and you're still going to get great final beer off of that. Speaking of which, kind of a, a more in-depth note, but while you're kettle souring with lacto, try to keep that anaerobic mm -hmm. as possible because that's really going to favor that – that uh, acid production. Uh, somebody's asking when it's when to add fruit to your kettle sour. Uh, you can add it to the boil. The only time that I would add it to the boil is if it's uh, cross sections of like a citrus fruit or a fruit that can actually get added benefits from heat. Um, high pectin content fruit can kind of do that sometimes, but what I really like to do is cook most fruit separately um, and then add that to secondary or add it as a flavoring addition late in the. Uh, uh, fermentation process. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we'll let lack, you know, sours go for a long period of time and just need to reflavor them at the end. So yeah, that's always what I I do, um, especially with a sour, because it'll help kind of dry that out and maintain that those fruit aromatics. Is is usually that's that's one of the very few occasions that I will do a secondary. Um, all I'll do is let the thing kind of go through its fermentation and then rack the beer onto a fruit. Um, would you try adding kombucha scoby to a sour? 
Uh, oh, I've seen people do that. The problem with the kombucha scoby is it's uh, a lot of different bacteria and yeast at play, and a lot of them aren't uh, alcohol tolerant. And so milk the funk, milk that funk. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, do it. I dare you. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that you get off of a kombucha scoby that you're aiming for is actually the acetobacter, which is a facultative anaerobe. Uh, basically, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't make acetic acid. It doesn't make that vinegar flavor unless it's uh, unless it's in an aerobic environment. So, or facultative aerobe, I think is what I was trying to say. Uh, but yeah, we should throw a scoby in one of our barrels <laughs> just to see what happens. I don't want to do uh, that. Oh yeah, so. speaking of which, I don't think we told him about that. Hey, we got barrels. Yeah, Tim got us some wine barrels, so we're gonna be throwing some saison in them and then uh, putting some some sour bugs in them here shortly. First sour with a wild brew sour pitch from Lalaman. Great flavor. pH drop is. Nice, 24 hours. 4.5 to 3.5, that's pretty good. Um, so the Lalamond uh, Wild Brew Sour Pitch, that's actually Lactobacillus plantarum, which is the same as the, uh, the Lactobacillus in, uh, uh, in Good Belly. So that's, uh, and that one is a nice one because that one can actually create lactic acid and not risk butyric acid even at room temperature. So if you're fermenting with the Lalamond uh, Wild whatever, Wild pitch, wild sour, wild brew. Then you can ferment that at room temperature and still get some great, uh, some great sourness. It yep. does end up a little bit sweet. If I found on that cold end. One of these days we'll have to play with the uh, Lactobacillus brevis from Imperial, which they don't have in homebrew smack pa- or not smack packs, but homebrew pitches. Dang them! So we're gonna have to get a ten barrel pitch of it one day. Sounds like a plan. Uh, would y'all get a good strawberry taste in a sour without using artificial flavorings post fermented? Last time we did a strawberry sour, we actually got a phenomenal grapefruit flavor. Um, that was with the hops too, though. Yeah, part yeah, a lot of that was the hops. A lot of it was our souring technique. It was a phenomenal beer. Um, actually, it was a technically a uh, uh, kettle soured um, strawberry milkshake IPA kind of hybrid thing. Uh, but yeah. we got a lot of flavors coming from our yeast. A lot yeah. of flavors coming from our hops. A lot of flavors coming from the sour. Uh, and then, of course, the strawberries by themselves. Yep. Yeah, strawberries, honestly, they work fantastic in sour beer, and that's because of the natural acidity <clears throat> of that fruit. Um, that fruit you can actually just throw in a beer, and the beer will end up tasting tart once those sugars ferment out from it. Um, I like to say uh, a lot of the beers you end up with are almost like strawberry shortcake kind of characters going on there. The problem with strawberries, in my mind, is that a lot of the strawberry flavors comes from the sweetness. And so if you want to maintain that strawberry flavor without using, you know, artificial flavorings and stuff like that, you've got to find a way to boost back that sweetness to get the same kind of component. Yeah, um, a little lactose never hurts. Yeah. Uh, but that said, I mean, they are, they are finicky fruit. They will ferment very, very strongly, which makes them different from something like a blackberry where you'll get a little bit more of the Yeah, blackberries are very, very mild, yeah. Um, what else we got? Bam. Only demand is that it's red, very red. And I'm thinking of developing from Irish Red Radio Tip to see. Oh, we actually have a really fun tip for using beer that we want to make red. Uh, make, I would say make a red beer. You can use some things like Red X or Special X to really pop that red color. Um, but what we would use is a, a hibiscus. Just a touch of hibiscus creates a nice tea-like quality and boldens red color immensely. Funny you say that. <laughs> Speaking of beers with hibiscus in them. This has a touch of hibiscus in it, hence be the pink color. Yeah, so if you were to make a red-style beer, uh, I would say something like, you know, uh, 85 to 90% base malt and then 10 to 15% yeah. blend of Special X and Red X, and then pop it with some hibiscus, it will be red AF. Also, if you don't mind the earthiness, um, beet juice works pretty well, too. Yeah, we did a beet beer last year, and it was nice and nice and bold. Um, is that it? Um, have you ever done a kettle sour saison? Kettle sour saison. Uh, Interesting. No, I haven't. I don't think we have. No. Uh, the only thing that I could see would be an issue with that, and it probably isn't really an issue, is that saison yeasts. A lot of them create uh, a much much drier beer. They'll actually keep breaking down um, higher starches and protein things that will create boldness or uh, mouthfeel and sweetness in beer. Uh, and so, if you ended up with something sour and bone dry. Uh, that could be maybe a little bit aggressive, but I mean, I think there's probably a way to do it right and make it taste good. Yeah. Probably just, you'll have to age it is probably the trick to that is yeah. that's kind of going to be one of those beers that hangs out for nine months or a year. But, uh, yeah. And I would, if you were doing that, I would definitely recommend 
lots and lots and lots of flaked adjuncts, um, oats and, and wheat. Wheat, wheat. Um, somebody was just asking about, um, what was it? Open fermentations. That's it. Um, and yes, we have actually done open fermentations. We try not to do them here because, um, they'll go kind of crazy with all the grain dust floating around here. Yeah. Uh, but open fermentations are fantastic, especially for your traditional wheat beers, because they'll really push through, um, those banana notes if you allow um, something to ferment openly. They yeah they create a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of softness but can push forward some fruit some fruitiness from the yeast um, and, and in a lot of cases they'll actually even create uh, some more neutral beers. So it kind of just depends if you yeah if we're yeah. fermenting in a controlled environment open fermentation is uh, I think is that's great. the biggest thing is yeah if you're gonna open ferment make sure you're in a highly controlled environment. Yep. Like like I said we don't like doing it here just because we know it's gonna get infected with some other crazy wild type yeast strain yeah unless you're talking about open fermentation for a true sour like uh um what is it jester king does uh there's a lot of famous sour sour breweries in uh, america that basically they have rooms designed to uh use a cool ship where you have a lot of surface area and they are able to funnel uh funnel air in a specific direction that helps them control uh helps them control what's going to get on them but it's always going to be a wild whatever's growing around them kind of yeast strain um again though in in a semi-controlled environment there yeah semi-controlled they, they uh, know what they're getting into but uh, that's something that we haven't played with a ton mostly yeah. because we don't have the right environment to do so yeah we'll just end up with quake and brett quake and brett infecting everything pretty much uh and yeah and if we had like a if we had a, like a farm area then we might be able to do something like that but yeah it'd be a little different anyway hidden, hidden mother tried that well i think that pretty much uh sums up the vigimos for today, yeah. Unless we got a couple questions, somebody's asking us if we've used endives, and that's a hard no on that. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I honestly will have to look up endives. I've heard that word before, but <laughs> couldn't even tell you what they look like. Um, so yeah, till next time. Cheers. Bam. Uh, let us know, by the way, if you've got any uh, anything you'd like to see regularly on this program. Uh, we'd like to be able to start structuring it in a way such that we create a good experience for you as well as for us um, and maybe hit on some things that we're not able to talk about in full length videos that we do. So uh, this is a good section to try to push on new tidbits. So let us know if you've got any ideas. We'll see you next week. Cheers. We already did that. Crop. Bam. Okay. Done. Done. Ah.